My name is Eric Williams and I work as a political reporter in Washington, D.C. I cover Congress, the President, and whatever happens to be the trending topic of the day. I have a couple of sources that I trust and a few that I don't. But as luck would have it, I have found that my most important source of reliable information turns out to be my dog, Applejacks. Let me back up a little. About three years ago, I was heading out of my apartment building to do a follow-up on a story. When I heard a rustling in the hedges that flank the wide stone steps by the entry. I figured that it must be the raccoon who had been getting into the dumpster, and I gave it no more thought. On my return trip at around 11 p.m., I was halfway up the stairs when I heard a low whine coming from the bushes. So I backed up and peered into the dark undergrowth till I spotted the reflection of two eyes looking back at me. They were a good three feet up from the ground, so I started to back up when I heard the unmistakable low thumping of a slowly wagging tail. Hey there, I said in a calming voice. I moved back and sat down quietly on the bottom step. You hungry, bud? Unzipping my backpack, I fished around at the bottom, but all I could find was an energy drink and an old single-serving pack of cereal, Apple Jacks. I opened it and set it down on the step next to me. It took a few minutes, but then he slowly stepped out of the bushes and made his way cautiously towards the food. He was big, but I could tell he was less than a year old. He was real thin and looked like he hadn't eaten in a while. Keeping one eye on me, he gingerly sniffed the Apple Jacks. Then hunger must have overtaken him and he wolfed down the cereal. He flipped the bag over with his nose, checking to make sure he hadn't missed any. Then he looked up at me. I let him sniff my hand and then slowly gave him a scratch behind the ears. Tail wagging, he climbed onto the same step that I was on. Then he sat down, leaning against me. And that was it. We've been together ever since. I looked online, checked the papers and the local bulletin boards for a few weeks to see if anyone was looking for him. After a while, I stopped checking. Soon we settled into a routine. I took him out in the morning, then he slept for most of the day. In the evening, we went for a long walk in the park. The park we visit is sort of a dividing line between the very rich section of town and the slightly run-down section where my apartment is located. It's a huge park that goes on for miles, with a small river running along the length of it. There is plenty of room for him to chase a ball or run around with other dogs, but it quickly became apparent to me that Jax didn't like the company of other dogs. He wasn't aggressive, he just completely ignored them. They would approach him, tail wagging, wanting to play, but he kept his eyes on me. Along the river there were several old stone bridges and he loved to run down them, a million miles an hour, race across, then turn around and run back to me. This ritual would be repeated at every bridge. I would stand there laughing, urgently calling him back, as if it was a life and death situation. Sometimes he was a little late with the brakes and he would plow into me, landing us both on the ground. Then, one particular Tuesday evening at the park, he crossed the bridge and stopped on the far side. He stood there looking into the woods. He glanced back as if to tell me something. Then he headed straight for the woods. I called, but he kept going. By the time I made it across the bridge, all I could see in the distance was a man kneeling over something on the ground. So I ran. What happened? I called out. As I approached, I saw the man had tears in his eyes. There was a golden retriever on the ground in front of him, and Jax was laying with his head on top of the dog's chest. Did he hurt your dog? I asked. No, the man said. I think he saved him. My dog was having a seizure. They're usually quick to stop if I can calm him down, but this time it wouldn't stop. Not until your dog came and laid down next to him. 
that seemed to calm him. Will you be able to get him home? I asked. Yes, I'll carry him. We live just over there. He pointed at a large house up on the hill. Well, I, I better get him home. Thank you. About a week later, the man with the golden retriever spotted us at the park. He waved and walked over with his dog. It turns out he was looking for us. It turns out his name was Gregory Williams. It turns out he was just elected to the House of Representatives. I am buying Jacks a triple cheeseburger on the way home. Maybe two. Since then, Gregory and I met at the park every Tuesday and we've become good friends. The dogs play together while we talk and once in a while he'll give me a heads up on a story. I'm always careful to keep his name out of it. Months went by and the first Tuesday in December rolled around. We met at the park as usual. While the dogs played, Gregory told me that he was leaving early for Christmas break, taking his family up to a cabin in Colorado. He invited me to come, with Jacks of course. I said that sounded great, but I couldn't take that much vacation time. He told me nothing's happening in DC until after the holidays. Here. He reached for my phone and entered a number. That's the phone to the cabin. Get away as soon as you can. Drive up to Colorado Springs and call me. I'll direct you to the cabin. Make sure you bring Jax and anyone else you like. I mean it. Please come. My wife and kids are dying to meet the hero that saved our dog. And you. I laughed. Okay, I'll try. He looked at me, paused, then said, if you get there by the 15th of December, I'll give you the story of a lifetime. Then he nodded and walked away, his dog followed behind. I stood there silently watching him go. Back in my apartment, I poured scoops of dog food into Jack's bowl, and I heated up some leftovers for myself. I had an interview tomorrow morning with Senator Susan Collins, the chairman of the Housing and Urban Development Committee so I sat down on my computer to finalize my questions. I turned on the local news as background noise while I worked. There had been two shootings and a robbery nearby. A 10-year-old had gotten lost and then was found safe at a local Walmart, and sky watchers may have a spectacular show in two weeks when a comet makes its closest approach on the 16th of December. Jax was sound asleep by the time I finished up and went to bed. I awoke in the morning to a soft beep of a message left on my phone. It was the senator's secretary canceling today's meeting. I called her office to reschedule, but there was only a recorded message saying the senator's office was closed for the holidays. With the morning off, I took Jax for a leisurely walk. Then I caught the train to the Capitol building. I walked over to the congressional offices to see if I could gather some info on an upcoming vote. The guard checked my press ID and nodded. I walked down the quiet hallway to the elevator. Stepping out on the fourth floor, I turned right and stopped. Ahead of me was a long hallway. There must have been twenty small offices. Every door was closed. Lights off. This was very odd, so I got back in the elevator. Stopping at every floor to check, the entire building was completely empty. This just doesn't happen. There are always congressional staff milling about. On my way out the door, I asked the guard what was going on. He just shrugged and said, no idea. Grabbing a coffee from a nearby street vendor, I sat down at a bench overlooking the main walkway. Taking out my phone, I called my list of political contacts one by one. Either there was no answer, or a message was left saying, I'm sorry the office is closed for the holidays. The Congress was slated to work until December 21st. Votes were scheduled for each day. This just doesn't happen. I sat there thinking, 
vaguely aware of the tourists passing by. A family with two kids sat down on the bench next to mine. The kids were asking their dad, will we be able to see it? Yes, their dad answered. You might not even need a telescope. Suddenly, I got this vision of thousands of people gathering with binoculars, having comet-themed parties. All the while, silent doom approached. Tossing my coffee into the garage, I headed for the train. I arrived home, took Jax out for a quick walk, and then sat down at my computer. What should I even look for? Impact? No, too many amateur astronomers out there. The news of a catastrophic impact would get out to the public. I spent the next week and a half achieving little to no results. Nothing in the news but excitement over the easily visible approaching comet. I even checked the conspiracy websites, but found nothing out of the ordinary. It was around 11 p.m. when it finally occurred to me that I should stop looking in the present and try looking into the past. I typed in the history of comets. Comets shed a lot of debris, pieces of which can slam into Earth. Comets can cause an air burst, igniting entire forests. They can also produce a high altitude haze of particles. A comet is linked to the Justinian Plague in 541 AD. It was the first recorded instance of the Black Plague in Europe, when cities struggled to clear the streets of the dead. There was the Comet of the Black Death in 1347. During the winter of 1664, a bright comet was seen in the London sky. The Great Plague ravaged England for the next two years. I stopped reading, and I realized that if something was coming, Washington was the last place I wanted to be. It was a quarter past midnight, the early morning of December 15th. If I threw my stuff in the car and drove straight through to Colorado Springs, with a little luck we could make it. I looked over at Jax. Wanna go for a ride?